Is this thing on? Perfect. All right. My name is Tony Arenas. I am a student at California Southern University, represent, and um, this is my presentation on bipolar disorder. I only have five minutes, so I'm going to try to get through it. Why I chose this disorder? I chose this disorder because it's actually a lot more common than people think when you work in this field. You're going to run into people that are uh, experiencing an episode, either a manic episode, hypomanic episode, or depressive episode. So uh, understanding the difference is important. Also because I have family members that have dealt with uh, bipolar disorder and are medicated now, uh, symptomology is down, and they're just surviving. That's why I chose this disorder. All right, cool. How was my hair? All right, cool. So um, the understanding of the diagnostic criteria. Okay, in order to diagnose for bipolar disorder, you must have certain factors in place. There are instruments that you can use, uh, professional uh, instruments that will test. Uh, these are called uh, psycho, uh, biopsychosocial assessments. And people go to school for many years, you know, get many degrees to be able to present the, these type of testings in a clinical setting. So last thing you want to do is go on Google and type in, am I bipolar? And then start telling people like, dude, I'm bipolar, dude, I'm bipolar, man. Whoa, bro. Because that's, that's first of all, it's inaccurate, it's unethical, and, it, and it's wrong. You, you know, um, diagno diagnostic criteria for bipolar disorder includes the presence of or history of a manic episode and a depressive episode. The manic episode can include um, feelings of euphoria, intense gra grandiosity, um, risk-taking, increased energy, insomnia, and it must last more than four days out of the week. So that's the, that's the manic episode. And the depressive episode, uh, the, feeling, the person feels worthless, it feels uh, empty, feels useless, and they have the uh, uh, suicide ideation. Not only, not only the thought of, of death, consistent thought of death, but the actual thought of, of dying, of killing themselves. So that's the, just in a nutshell, um, bipolar 2 disorder is, is different in, um, first, you don't need a manic episode for bipolar 2, uh, only a hypomanic episode. That's kind of like the lesser version of a manic episode um, where you don't need hospitalization, but it's still significant, significant impairment. The person's still not able to go to work. The person's still not able to go to school, do their homework, uh, sleep. They lost their appetite. They're still having suicidal thoughts. So that's the difference between bipolar 2 and bipolar 1. Uh, comorbidity with this disorder includes substance, substance abuse disorder, major depressive disorder, schizophrenia, uh, attention deficit disorder, uh, bulimia, and uh, anorexia. Uh, feeding disorders, eating disorders, and usually it begins with an eating disorder at a young age. So the you, you, the person can have like bulimia or anorexia growing up, and then around 19, 18, 19 years old, that's when the first episode, manic episode, really takes place. Hospitalization is needed, and then that's when you can diagnose for bipolar one. Um, usually, that's the onset. Age of onset is between nineteen and uh, twenty one years old depending on environment, depending on the risk factors, and depending on the her, uh, heredity of the, of, the, of, the, of the person. So bipolar disorder has a very, very high percentage of um, predisposition genetically, so which means if your parents had bipolar disorder, more than likely you will, you will be dealing with it as well. If it runs in your family, uh, it, you're probably going to end up dealing with it as well. So that's something very important to ask during assessment is what is your family history of mental illness? Um, I would also ask what kind of medication are you taking or what kind of medication have you ever taken? Have you ever been diagnosed for any type of mental disorder? These are the questions I would ask during intake or during an assessment. Also, I would, I would recommend the person that comes in to be clean and sober for 30 days. The reason is because sometimes uh, certain substance abuse, certain drugs can mimic the symptoms of, of bipolar disorder. Uh, bipolar disorder is a brain imbalance where research shows that the neurotransmitter dopamine is an excess in the brain. 
which uh, dopamine is a feel good feel good neurotransmitter you release dopamine on a natural level when you eat when you have sex when you're with friends when you're watching tv when you're playing video games when this your brain is telling you this is good keep doing it but with bipolar disorder you have an extreme load of dopamine so it doesn't know where to stop it's seeking to reduce the symptomology and sometimes with the use of substance abuse you the use of drugs they can mimic what it's a, a stable phase um, so I would say I would ask the person if it's possible they can be clean and sober for 30 days so that I don't, so we don't diagnose them with the wrong disorder. Oh my God, my puppy wants to go out. This is the wrong timing. Come on, babe, stay with me. Okay, so I'm at five minutes. This that's almost my time up. Treatment is. Uh, Evidence-based treatment, I would say cognitive behavioral therapy is one of my favorites. It's uh, <clears throat> challenging irrational thinking uh, with homework assignments. And the idea behind cognitive behavioral therapy is that if the person changes their thinking, they can change their behavior. That's just, that's just the model of cognitive behavioral therapy. So by letting the person explore the uh, motivational interviewing and the stages of change, do you think we have a problem? Do you want to get better? That's how it begins, open-ended questions, and then we can gauge how bad or how how you know, how they portray their, their illness to be and if they desire to get help. Um, at that point, I would suggest medication as well. Bipolar disorder is a, is a, is a brain disease, so medication can stabilize the individual. I would stay away from antidepressants because um, sometimes when a person's in a in a in a depressive state, the first the first thought is I need an antidepressant to get me out of this, but they don't realize that that's a that's that's a, that's a, that's a that's a depression state. Next is manic, so it's comorbid. It's happening this way, so it's manic depression, manic depression, and then um, if you treat the depression at that point, you may have a situation where the person becomes suicidal. The person, you know, the increases the thoughts of suicide. So I would probably, uh, I'm not a psychiatrist, uh, but I would probably, I've read in research studies that lithium is the drug to help stabilize the individual. So, um, also um, antipsychotics as well. And that's when the person's in a manic stage. Um, so this, these are just ideas for treatment. Um, it takes time. It's going gonna, it's gonna to take getting to know the individual. That's very important. I would incorporate all the models of treatment, including behavioral therapy, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, medication-assisted treatment, and the peer model. The peer model is very important. I'm always promoting self-help because, one, it's free, and two, it's a bunch of people trying to help themselves. Um, the, the peer model, peer-to-peer, -peer. There's, a, there's a bunch of great support groups out there. Uh, NAMI is one of them, National Alliance for Mental Illness. Um, they have different branches in every state. Uh, it's a national organization. You also have Recovery International. They deal with all kinds of emotions. You also have Emotions Anonymous, and you also have Depression Bipolar Alliance support group. You can Google them, find the group that's, the, find the location closest to you and show up in person. I would suggest that because when you show up in person, you're you are uh, you're meeting people dealing with the same disorder and surviving, dealing with the same issue and surviving. So you feel like you belong. First of all, you you have a sense of belonging, of fellowship. You find your tribe. You don't no longer feel alone, isolated, or like or like you're different. Like you just want to die. So I would definitely uh, promote that. And I think um, <clears throat> that's the end of my uh, presentation. I hope you liked it. Yeah, Cal Southern baby. I love this school. I promote it. I suggest you. I suggest you enroll. Classes begin um, every every month, so uh, there, it's online. It's a regional accreditation. Um, some of the uh, most amazing instructors uh, work there. People that actually work in the field, um, not only uh, you know, not only in the academic level, but they actually work in the field of mental health. And I think that that kind of experience shows in the way they teach and their their perception of of uh you know what mental health is i hope you enjoy my presentation and i'll see you later you want to see my puppies okay i'll show you
Yeah, how exciting. Hello. This is Snoopy. Hey, Mummers. This is Snoopy. Look. And this is Peanut. She's a baby. Hi, you're so good. You were so good. You were so good. You did not make a sound. You were such a good baby. And this is Snoopy. Uh, you're, you're always good. Good baby. Anyway, that's all for now. I guess I'll see you in the next video. See you. Bye-bye.